everyone, my name is Polina and welcome back to Polina's Pages. With less than a week left before Christmas, I fell into a little bit of a wormhole, which ultimately led to this video. And at the end, stay tuned because I will be recommending some books to fit in before December 25th. I thought I'd skip the origins of Christmas and the whole December 25th originally being a Dia Solis and Victinatius and this like Roman holiday of people celebrating the winter solstice because people still disagree on many of these things and I do want today to be more book focused. There has come to be a Christmas archetype that is basically one, the welcoming of wonder into the human world, aka those Christmas miracles, two, contact with the other side, and three, the spirit of Christmas being generous and spending time with your family. So let's take a closer look at how these themes came to be about. Is it any surprise that Dickens' A Christmas Carol made it onto the list? The book popularized the idea of this return and this bond between the living and the dead through Scrooge meeting with the three ghosts, the ghosts of the past, the present, and the future. It made Christmas to be a time to look back on the past. Scrooge realized what would happen if he didn't and he turned to kindness, forgiving, and he ended up reuniting with his family on Christmas Day. In case you're not familiar with the story, the main character Scrooge is incredibly grumpy, says humbug a lot, and is basically the Grinch as a person. Some ghosts show up and show him that no one's going to be sad when he dies, and Scrooge embraces the Christmas spirit. First published on December 19th, 1843, the first edition is already sold out by Christmas Eve. Since then, the book has become hugely popular and saw many adaptations and references in countless TV show episodes and general pop culture. But it wasn't just hugely important to all of Christmas literature today, it was also, like some other works in this video, a social commentary. In 1843, there was the New Poor Law, aka the families who weren't well off, they were forced to live in terrible living conditions to the point where they weren't dying, but their life was absolutely horrendous and the message was just made clear. Poverty was criminalized and the message was don't be poor or you'll end up like these souls. Times were really hard. The England was in the hot or rather in the cold of the little ice age and there was also mass starvation going around the country. Dickens made a lot of charitable donations and in 1843 he made a speech for the Manchester Athenaeum which was a society dedicated to providing education for the working classes. Even before Dickens wrote his novels, employees in industrial centers such as said Manchester were aiming to reduce the tensions between classes but as John R. Gill Gillis remarks yeah Gillis remarks in a world of their own making Dickens really led the charge he highlighted the importance of helping the poor Scrooge himself does so at the end of the novel he promises Bob Cratchit that he will quote raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family it is also interesting to note some biographical elements Dickens himself was forced to work in a factory as a child so perhaps that contributed to his empathy and understanding and aim to help the working classes. They were not a handsome family, they were not well dressed, their shoes were far from being waterproof, their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. There was a divide then, as there is now, this lack of want to think about those who are less well off during Christmas as if it could somehow impact your own happiness. And Dickens, by showing them to be happy without money, by showing them to be content with what they have, with the family that they have, shows them to be people. And it's not the money that matters, it's the family is his main message. But this generous spirit of helping the poor and ge general generosity is not the only Christmas tradition that we owe in a way to Dickens. Christmas as a trend was slightly dead, but Dickens definitely helped in reviving it and especially in reminding the world that this is in fact a Christmas holiday by including lavish Christmas traditions like feasting and drinking and praying. It's a story where God's grace really matters. The food is blessed, the feasts are blessed. The ghosts themselves could be incarnations of God. It is very specifically a Christmas festivity in Dickens' eyes and ones that he it's one that he aimed to revive throughout his novel. Dickens also made the traditions we have today hugely important. He has a line in his book, attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. This was an early example of the tradition of gift giving. He normalized it as if it had always been there. He makes reference to them once or twice, but he doesn't really draw attention to them. They're, they're posited as an important thing, but one that's not overly unusual, as if it's just a tradition 
that has been there for all of generations when in fact it was specifically Dickens's work that made it more popular such as for example not only gift giving but carol singing in general it wasn't really a thing but at the start of the book Scrooge chases away carolers but at the end he really embraces them which is synonymous with Christmas cheer and so we sing carols in modern times. A fun fact and a little Christmas moral during the printing of the first editions, Dickens lost quite a bit of money because he wanted to have them bright and attractive and happy for the children, and his publishers were being a little Scrooge-worthy themselves. But the book eventually became a bestseller and he did get that money back. So <laughs> Christmas moral of today's video, put in your energy. <laughs> The story of the Nutcracker, or as we say in Russia, Shilkunchik, was uh, originally an adaptation of Hoffman's novel The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, but the original was considerably more darkened than the adaptation we have today, and the famous version that is Tchaikovsky's ballet, ballet in 1892. I do apologize if I mispronounce ballet <laughs> in Russian. It's the T is pronounced. It explores themes of being alive and unalive, animate and inanimate objects, the transformations, and of course the power of love. In Russia it was also hugely important as it popularized the appearances of the Christmas trees through the illustrations that accompanied the book. Hoffman was a romanticist, and the original saw the, this love between animate and inanimate as a bad thing. He believed that the only thing that you should love so passionately is, of course, life. His 1816 tale was adapted by Alexandre Dumas, and this is the version that's famous today. It follows the story of Clara, a young girl who goes downstairs on Christmas Eve because she really wants to play with her favorite toy, the Nutcracker. There she finds this wizard called Drosselmeyer who whisks her away on a magical adventure where she is forced to fight the Mouse King. Clara successfully defeats the Mouse King, of course. It wouldn't be Christmas without good, good battling out evil and ultimately emerging victorious. And so they go to Sugar Plum Fairy land, I believe it's called the Kingdom of Sweets, and the Sugar Plum Fairy performs dances and there's just a lot of joy and beauty. From this you have the whole fairies and magical and like sweet element to Christmas and I'm not sure if it's the same in other countries but in Russia occasionally people dress up as snowflakes as a sort of homage to this particular scene. People spend a lot of money on nutcrackers, especially around Christmas, since the first act of the play took part during Christmas and is just generally viewed as a Christmas decoration because of this play. Uh, there's actually like whole museums devoted to this, like the Leavenworth Nutcracker Museum in Washington that has over 4,000 figurines. The Nutcracker is viewed as a very important story for Christmas. It's performed countless times, especially around this wintry time, and it has also had a huge influence on the world of music. A little girl is very hungry and cold and dying as a very sharp antithesis to the festivities going on around her and at the end her deceased grandma or sometimes god or an angel in different versions comes and takes her to heaven and to god and it's just very synonymous of this kind of thing that we associate with god's grace around christmas and a reminder that the miracles in christmas like time they're not completely independent from god it's since this is a Christian holiday, it's of course like a, like miracles that come directly from God's grace since it's a festivity celebrating specifically the light and like the joy of the time. The story ends with everyone seeing the child smiling but frozen to death. However, we as the reader know that she's out there having fun in heaven and those Christmas trees and the worms and everything is great and of course we have this theme of family return since it's specifically her grandmother and again this contact with the other side is mentioned in the beginning and I, I mean I don't think any heart can be left unmelted by this story so hopefully this will motivate everyone to partake in charity and just general kindness that we associate with Christmas. Like A Christmas Carol, it also focuses on this divide between the poor and the rich, and that equals a Christmas miracle, but where we expect it to be from people who take pity on this girl and cross this divide, it is in fact God who does that, and so it's a reminder, again, of God's grace and specifically his influence. I hope you found that interesting to see how these three works cemented the beliefs that we have around Christmas and the things that that we expect. So just two more contemporary works that I wanted to mention before moving on to my recommendations. The first is of course The Chronicles of Narnia. 
I'm sure it's what many associate as the book, like the Christmas book, rather than those classics. It's just become like a very, like it's just become a book and like a film that everyone knows. In the line, the witch and the wardrobe, the white witch, she, she's evil. She hinders the arrival of Christmas, whereas Aslan is just and good, and Santa Claus's arrival foreshadows that of Aslan. So in a way, Aslan is like the reincarnation of God. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is definitely a Christmas tale with the whole hope and the perfect snow and good defeating evil once more. Even Harry Potter, I would say, is now considered a Christmas movie because of certain elements. For example, Harry visits the grave of his parents on Christmas Eve and he hears carolers and on the grave it says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is dead. And so it's love and life that defeat Voldemort, Harry, wins and emerges victorious ultimately with his mother's love. The festive decorations and just the general like settings that we associate with Christmas also help of course, but I do think that these works in particular played a central theme in the associations that we have today and how we view Christmas as a time for family and that like Christmas spirit much more than the material side of things like the decorations and the gifts that that is just like a part of the magic. There's less than a week left and I know we're all probably busy with preparations and of course that urgent rush to get presents if you haven't already and I think it's just a guarantee of fatigue but it is also something to look forward to every year. Hopefully these three books will help calm you down or on the contrary scare the evil out of you. The first three I really enjoyed, <laughs> I would recommend but I would recommend if you want something dark, <laughs> but the last two are more like light and fun, but I didn't love them as much. If on a winter's night a traveler, this is one of my favorite books this entire year. And it, I mean, if you're watching this video, you probably like to read, right? This, well, this book, it will make you fall in love with reading even more. It's absolutely brilliant in that regard, and of course many more. It's a whole experience, everything, and Italo Calvino really gets it. The process of going to a bookshop and looking for a book, of connecting with other readers, of trying to find the ideal book that you're gonna love for the rest of your life, trying to find the perfect reading position, every little element in reading, it's here. And I really don't want to give much away because I don't think it will be as magical then, but there, can I just say, the main characters are literally readers. <laughs> That's like their defining characteristics that they like to read. And you know what, you as a reader too, you also partake in the story as like a third reader. And also, not just one story, but a whole ten of them. Yes, this is like incredibly complex and layered, but it's also so much fun. If you don't like classics, I'm asking you to please give this a chance because I guarantee that if more classics like this, if more classics were like this, then more people would read them. And like, yes, I did say that it's kind of complicated, like a little bit, and it's postmodern to the point where I think I found my EPQ project, but ultimately it's just a really, really magical book with a lot happening there and with its descriptions in the second person is just very unique and I hope you will enjoy it. Final words, don't read any blurbs, just go into this book. I'm trying not to spoil too much, but this is just incredible. And if you read one book from this video, I'm begging you that it's this book because If on a Winter's Night literally needs more hype. So please, please give this a chance. Don't feel like having your mind hurt a little? Well, how about your heart? You'll have trouble breathing in the fresh air of the North Pole emanating all throughout this book. And of course, being fine while awfully goes through these like narrow brushes with death. If you want some action and a very intriguing fantasy world and you just like YA, if you don't like YA I think you'll struggle with this one a bit, may I present to you A Winter's Promise. I haven't read YA in a long time but this did kind of save my urge a little bit even though I wasn't aware that I was looking for some YA in my life right now, but I do not recommend this to anyone who has experience with fantasy. I do think the world building lacked a tiny tiny bit, even though it was very intriguing, but this is a series, so hopefully it will improve as the books progress. Basically, it follows Ophelia, who has to be forced into an arranged marriage, and she, her fiancé is basically this cold, sharp, mean person called Thorn, I hated the name Thorn, but I did love the magical elements, in particular Ophelia also being a reader, we're really going with the reading theme today, and so she can basically touch objects and like read their history, so that's an- if you're intrigued by that concept then 
I recommend you pick up this book. Ophelia is also like quite charming as a character. I think you'd like her. She's very small and every page or so there's a description of her blowing her nose, <laughs> which is a little bit strange because there is like a little bit of that she's not like other girls situation but personally i didn't mind it a lot this time because it is quite entertaining watching her be very small and trying not to get killed as there literally is a whole battle thing going on that she wasn't expecting which i realize sounds kind of mean of me to say but it was entertaining oh so yeah it's not the best book i ever read it's definitely not a new favorite but it is entertaining it is fun and I guess it just fits the mood right now, the whole snow outside, so if you're looking for 600 pages of medium slash fast paced and a slow burn, I'm pretty sure that's Ophelia and Thorne are gonna end up together, but I can't make any promises. I don't know, I've only read the first book. Finally, we have The Only Good Indians, which is just so, so, so disturbing. I'm having war flashbacks right now. After reading it, I'm about halfway through, I had to stop and drink some water and like cool my horse throat from all the screaming I did before proceeding. It is very disturbing, but I literally can't put it down. The, the way that the story progresses is absolutely riveting so far. Everything is exciting. I'm just waiting for all the paranormal stuff to go down. It's very gory, but the execution so far is great. This book, like A Winter's Promise, is a little bit far from the whole like cheery, festive Christmas ideas. But it does set place like it does take place in winter and I think there's a time for wintery reads and like snowy reads and well I live in Russia so look outside I guess the time is now. <laughs> this is why I said if you don't want non-stop death, because again, this is very gory, please check trigger warnings for all the books. Just pick up if on a winter's night a traveler. Basically, a few days before Thanksgiving, four good Indians, as they refer to themselves, kill some elk and they don't pay homage to the land. And so there's a bloodthirsty ghost seeking its revenge. <laughs> so if that doesn't say Christmas spirits, well, what does? I'll update the descriptions when I finish so you can find out more about it, but I did want to include the, the book in this video so far because it's going really great. And just again, the descriptions of animals are quite brutal. It's not for the faint of hearted, so if you're easily creeped out by that description of blood and the likes, Maybe it's not for you. Finally, I just wanted to say and give two more book recommends that I'm not really the best person to come to when it comes to cheery Christmas recommends and I'm not really a fan of romance. I was before, but in recent years it has kind of dwindled out. One Day in December would have been great. It had a plot I liked, it had dialogue I liked, except for the fact that I hated the, the main love protagonist, the male one. But I do want to say that my friend who likes romance and who reads a lot, she said that she liked the guy, I'm just picky, which is true, the latter part is true. I don't like the guy, but I am very picky. So I think that if you like romance, odds are you would enjoy it because in all other elements than him, I did have fun with it. How about a summer read that takes place on the beach between two authors who write, one writes like murder and one writes like romance and it's enemies to lovers and I think this is one of my favorite romances potentially so if you want to have something far away from right now then pick up Beach Read. I hope you find a book that you like and I hope that you found the video interesting. Hopefully everything worked because the camera did cut out a few times. But yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you next week.